positivo de COVID y como nosotros somos muy cuidadosos sobre todo los que trabajamos en ciberseguridad la verdad es que preferí omitir mi presencia y es la razón por la cual no pude participar de 8.8 gobierno así que estoy muy emocionado porque es mi primera 8.8 del año 2021 y estamos en nuestra segunda versión de 8.8 solidaria por segundo año consecutivo apoyando a Cure AHC Chile eh, los que no saben, nosotros llevamos cinco años haciendo 8.8 Solidaria y los tres primeros años apoyamos a la Teletón. La idea es hacer un ciclo nuevamente de tres años consecutivos con otra organización de beneficencia y luego esos tres años volver a apoyar a otra. Pero todo lo que reunimos en este evento, absolutamente todo, el 100%, va en ayuda de una fundación benéfica, en este caso de Cure AHC Chile. Eh, les quiero comentar sobre la agenda. Antes sí quiero partir agradeciendo a los productores, auspiciadores. Eh, hoy día no auspicia. Eh, básicamente tenemos a Nastec. Quiero agradecer a Nastec, a Tecnovan, a Serio X World y a My Public Inbox. Y de manera muy especial a Mundo Hacker, que de hecho a través de Antonio Ramos nos regalaron una serie de entradas que pudimos repartir principalmente entre alumnos de colegio, entre alumnos de universidades principalmente. Así que esperamos que puedan disfrutar esta nueva jornada solidaria con una cruzada hacker solidaria. Tenemos una agenda de lujo. Eh, vamos a estar ahora pronto. Voy a anunciar a, a nuestro Kino, que es Jason Street. Luego a las 11 nos va a acompañar Carmen Torrano. Va a estar también con nosotros a las 12 Santiago López, más conocido como Mala Suerte, un hacker eh, de mucha trayectoria en España. Va a estar también con nosotros Selva Orejón, que por primera vez debuta en 8.8. Va a estar también con nosotros Jessica Matus y vamos a terminar con el gran Dragon Yard o Jaime Restrepo. Así que yo no les quiero quitar más tiempo, así que quiero ir directo con nuestro primer eh, keynote, con nuestro primer expositor, con Jason Street. La verdad es que Jason Street, ustedes lo pueden buscar en Google y lo van a encontrar. Fue elegido el 2006 como una de las personas del año por Times es hacker y embajador de Defcon Groups y de Hack Not Crime. Así que disfruten de esta leyenda. Es la segunda vez que Jason está con nosotros en 8.8. Me contaba que lamentablemente el año pasado quedó con ganas de venir a 8.8. Hizo un recorrido virtual de Santiago, así que esperamos invitarlo físicamente. Jason, thank you so much for your support. We hope that we can invite you the next year for Chile to do a physical conference and thank you so much because we, we know that you did only a few talks this year as in an honor uh, for us to have with us uh, today thank you so much gracias uh what ideas uh uh and unfortunately that's probably the most of my spanish that i can do without uh ruining the language uh I, I have to uh, apologize. I'm American, so I only speak one language, and I'm from Texas. I don't speak it very well, um, but I make up for it. I talk very loud and fast. <laughs> so 
Uh, so I've got this talk now. I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully everybody can see the kittens. Yes. Okay, so this talk, I usually do a warning sign when I'm doing a, um, the, uh, hold on, I'm trying to see if I can. Okay, I'm, try I'm sorry, uh, I, was, I was trying to trying to get that one thing done. It's like, uh, so what I'm going to do is I, uh, I set up a warning label for people. So it's like, cause usually some of my talks are offensive, meaning that I'm breaking into places and doing things like that. And, and instead of that, what it is, I'm going to be uh, offending a lot of people in our industry. So, uh, so that's what this is about. This is uh, uh, about our uh, industry uh, talk. This is pointed to us. So uh, the title of the talk is No Pass for Human Regret, Breaking People to Break into Networks. Uh, and and basically, it's like I'll, I've always said, uh, when you break into a server or um, compromise it or expose vulnerabilities in a server or a network, uh, you don't hurt its feelings. It doesn't get, it doesn't feel bad that you compromise it's just a computer. It's inanimate. Uh, so the same can't be say when you break into a network using a employee, using a person, uh, when you uh, misdirect them, uh, when you uh, tell them what, uh, that you're doing one thing and then you do something else. That's the difference. So we're going to talk into that and we're going to delve into that a little bit more. This is mostly about the ethics of red teaming. Uh, this is the bio because there's supposed to be a bio page of who I am. Um, it, it is the least interesting and uh, I, you, can, you can search on that stuff. It's like uh, uh, the whole thing. So uh, there's no patch for human stupidity. I think we've all seen these t-shirts and I have to admit that I own one. Um, I actually used to wear, I mean, I before I evolved my outlook on what I do, this was hilarious. But it's not anymore. And we're going to go into why that is. Uh, and also I have to say, when I go in, uh, and I talk about these things. I'm talking about this industry. Remember, I'm going from my perspective and my path. I'm not calling anyone else out in red teaming. I'm not calling anyone else in blue teaming. I'm not calling out, well, I'm calling out a couple of companies specifically, but I'm not calling out anyone in our industry. Uh, that, that finger is pointed directly at me. I'm looking at the mirror when I talk about these issues because everything I, I talk about I had, I had those attitudes, I had, those, but I changed and I hope more of the people in the industry change. So uh, there's no passion. I hate this cartoon. This is the actual cartoon that ran in the papers that people were like, boom, this is, should be good. Um, it's got the data security. It's got, um, Technology in one corner, and then Dave in the other corner. Um, and that's so insulting, and that's how our industry handles users. We like to use them as the excuse for our bad technology. Instead of trying to get uh, technology, more and more technology, to protect the humans, why don't we get the humans to protect the technology. They are better suited for that than the technology, but we don't give them credit and we write them off and we treat them like a liability instead of an asset. And a funny story, I was so upset about this cartoon that my boss at the time, Jason Burns, 
actually contacted the artist and had them fix it. That is how you should be seeing your users. That is what your users are. They are a wonderful resource for you to go to to help you defend your company. But are we doing that? Are we actually utilizing them like that instead of just writing them off? So that's what uh, that's how the cartoon should have always been. So I want to address two problems. Problem number one, offensive teams don't have to be so offensive. And, and what do I mean by that? I mean, what are the functions of the red team? We have gotten to the point where red teams are the ones that break things in, that they're like something separate from the industry. They're like this, uh, Everybody wants to be a red teamer. Everybody, when they break, when they want to get into information security, they want to get into pen testing. They want to get into breaking things. And I always have to remind people, you do understand that the only reason that red teams exist is to make the blue teams better. And when I say red teams, just for people who don't know, Red teams mean people who do external exercises. They take on the role of the adversary to test vulnerabilities in a network. So they're the offensive teams. And then the blue teams are the defensive teams. They're the ones that work in the information security, the, the SOC, the, uh, they do the protections of a company. Uh, they man the firewalls, the IDSs, to do the hard work. Um, so that has always been the red team's function is just to make the blue team better. The red team does not exist without the blue team. It's like, so the blue team is hiring or utilizing a red team mindset just to make their defenses better. And we've lost that along the way. Red teams have gotten so to the point where it's this big macho, you know, oh, I'm I'm the red team. I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna smash things. It's like and, and like 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 that's 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 going to help your users. Like like that approaches to your users that you're an advocate for them for securing them when you're coming off more like an adversary. How are they supposed to react? One of the sayings that upset me the most, um, and there's so many different red teamers I've heard say this over the years, I mean, over the last decade, I keep hearing this quote in uh, books and talks, and it's like uh, from conversations. Uh, this is a quote from Mike Tyson. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Okay. First of all, I personally don't get any kind of life advice from a convicted rapist who tattoos his face and thinks that's a good idea. And when he got punched so much uh, in the face during a boxing match, he bit the ear off of his opponent. Second of all, I'm tired of him getting so much credit for these quotes. Mike Tyson borrowed this quote from Helmut von Moltke, the elder, the Prussian general. He said, no battle plan ever survives contact with the enemy. So instead of a quote trying to mean like you're you're a big bad guy that you're going to come in and you're going to show your clients, you're going to punch them in the face and see if they have a plan and show them where their vulnerabilities are. This was supposed to be a warning to red teams because plans are ever changing. The battle is ever changing. When you go to attack, you never know what's going to be responding. You never know what their forces are going to be like or what securities are in place. 
it's like so all your plans and your your recon will not withheld uh, withhold sometimes the actual engagement actual going in and breaking in so it should be more of a warning now, now i wanted to give mike tyson a little bit of credit you know i, I don't like being totally negative on someone so I found this quote from Mike Tyson. I thought this was a really good one. Everybody you fight is not your enemy, and everybody that helps you is not your friend. That is a very good infosec quote. Because pen testing, even though I'm fighting you, I'm not your enemy. And sometimes your employees or your contractors or your um uh, your connections, your uh, other companies, the colleagues are not your friend. Yeah, but he stole that one too. What are you going to do? It's like, so I think my best Mike Tyson quote comes from someone who's not Mike Tyson. This is John Oliver. Because there's a rule, if your life intersects with Mike Tyson's in any way whatsoever, it is bedtime for you. He is the canary in the coal mine for all of us. Very well said. Uh, so that's the problem. We've become so adversarial. We have created that mindset that we're boxing and we're battling our clients, that our job is to batter them. Our job is to punch them. Our job is to be that offensive. We are an advocate to help them be better secure. We are doing adversarial simulations to check where the vulnerabilities are so they can be fixed. Now, that offensive red team mentality bleeds over to the blue team in the worst possible ways. Instead of just getting the blue teams and the uh, internal security to think as an adversary in a way to look for vulnerabilities, to try to find vulnerabilities in their network, they're beating up the users like they were beat up by the red team. It's just a chain of abuse that they're going through. And I, and one of the epitomes of this happened Christmas. This happened uh, just this last Christmas, 2020, uh, and it was the catalyst for this talk. I was so outraged by it. Uh, I literally created this talk uh, based on this, but I found so much other worse things too. GoDaddy, the web hosting company, during the middle of a pandemic, when people were losing their jobs, they were trying to make sure they had money for rent. They were trying to see if they could survive the winter uh, during a plague, decided to send all their employees and telling them they uh, got a Christmas bonus. Now, there is one specific thing that I do when I'm doing a security awareness engagement. When I am showing executives when I'm doing demonstrations on the stage, my phishing messages are diabolical. They are very, I, I involve people that have died. I involve uh, uh, casualties that have happened in the area, uh, natural disasters. I've brought up horrible things to show people how dangerous it can be, how people will get you to click on a link using very bad means. 
and I've always stressed that I would never, ever send that out to a real employee. You never manipulate an employee like that. It is good for a demonstration. You don't manipulate it like that. That that, and we'll get a little bit more. And another one. This happened in February of 2021. They were telling people that they got back, they could get vaccines. They're telling the workers to register for people desperately scrambling to get the vaccine. At the very beginning of 2021, a company, a library decided to fish their employees, thinking it was a good idea to fish their employees that they could get a COVID-19 vaccine. You do not mess with your employees' livelihood or their life. Those are two things that you do not use as fishing subjects internally. You could use those as demonstrations, never in a real life exercise. Because guess what? You may have had uh, a couple of disgruntled employees, potential insider threats in your network. After you sent that email out, after you sent that phishing email out and, and promised them a bonus or a vaccine, and it turns out that they're in trouble and you faked it, and there is no bonus or vaccine opportunity, congratulations. Your insider threat has quadrupled. Because now, instead of just having a couple, I would be like every other one. I would be a longstanding employee, and I would have received that, and I would be mad AF. It, it would be very bad. But also the same thing, so you can't do that, but the same thing goes to red teamers. Red teamers have this mentality where it's like they go in they can break these things, compromise these people, and then they're like, we're done. Here's your report. We'll work with you some of the remediations. But the company might have a lot of hurt feelings left over from that red team, especially if they did social engineering. So basically, we've got to learn to be better at giving a constructive, positive message to the users that we compromise directly. And I will admit, I've made mistakes. I've talked in several of my talks that we don't have time to get into now uh, for little stories, but there's talks where it's like, I've promised uh, a bank manager all these new computers just to the end of the, the engagement that he got to find out that they weren't coming uh, because I lied, because I needed to compromise his whole bank and get access to his network and his computers, which I did. So yay me, but, but how, how did that, what did I leave behind? That was on me. Uh, and I've, I've done that on uh, several different times. I, but one engagement, it, I believe it was in West Virginia for this location, and I, and I can't uh, say where, but my whole outlook ch uh, changed. Because a person opened the door, uh, I held the door open for me and let me come in. But I saw their face, and I realized they knew they shouldn't have done that. And then as I'm walking down the hallway, and I've already compromised a couple of machines, I've already won. I saw them talking to another person, looking at me and talking and discussing it. And I know they were calling security. I know they were uh, going to report me. I know they were going to do the right thing. I could have left out the door. The door was right there next to me. They were down that hall. I could have left and been free and clear, great findings, I'm the hero. Or I could change it up a little bit 
and lose. I could let them catch me, fix their mistake, and be able to recover from it. And that's exactly what I did. I got caught. That was such a bigger impact for that company's security because why I was able to show vulnerabilities, I was able to hold one of their employees up who did the right thing and show them by example what they should be doing, not all the things that they did wrong. From that engagement, from, from then all the way to now, I will always, always lose part of the engagement. The first two days, I will destroy you the best I possibly can. On the third day is the day I get caught. I'm more obvious. I'm more uh, just apparent in what I'm doing. It's like I make it very easy to get caught because that's what it's about. It's about the lessons, not the winning, not, the, not me winning. It's about the client winning, learning the lessons. Sometimes the hardest part of winning sometimes is dealing with sore losers. More than once, after I've already won and I've allowed myself to get caught, and then I explained to the people what I was doing, how this was a thing, and even having an employee vouch for me there, yeah, they still wanted to call the cops. <laughs> they, they, yeah, they still wanted to call the cops. It's like, it, and I had to do with that. So you're also social engineering the people that you social engineered. Um, So what do we do internally? What do the blue teams do before the red teams even get there? I do something what I call the three E's. Educate, empower, and enforce. This is what we need to start doing. First, we need to start teaching, educating your users. What is the biggest problem with security awareness classes? They're boring. Very, very, very boring. Not interesting. How does it relate to me? How is this a thing? Information security has to learn to engage their users in information security. From day one, on the first day that they're hired, they need to learn what their responsibilities are. You teach them that their job role, they are responsible for answering this many emails or processing this many whatevers, or you give them metrics for what they do. You need to include in those roles and responsibilities is securing the network. That is a job responsibility, not an afterthought, not a test they take once a year that they click the answers multi-choice and say they're security aware. It is a job responsibility for them to keep their job. They have to make sure they're not clicking on malicious links. They have to make sure they're reporting things that uh, are suspicious. The next thing is we need to empower them. That's where the security team, we can't just put it all on them. It is security's team. It is the blue team's job, the company's job to empower the employees to be able to do that without any repercussions, without uh, any hindrance or adversarial relations if they try to report something or something that fails. Um, one of the way that we do this is does your does your company have an extension a phone extension or an email address dedicated to information security 
So if someone does see something, they can report it immediately. And do everybody in that company know what that number is? Do they know what that email is? Are you creating an environment that rewards that kind of activity? Because when I talk about uh, enforcement, it's not just negative enforcement. We need to reinforce the ideas that security is an everyday thing. Create a raffle every quarter, uh, a drawing, a, a, a contest. And in this contest, what you do is you put in that uh, if you report a suspicious email, if you report, if, uh, if you'll get uh, one entry into the contest. If that suspicious email turns out to be an actual phishing email, you get ten entries into the contest. Now, if you see someone walking into the facility without a badge and you question them or you report it to security that's 20 entries now as your company you can set aside every quarter um a thousand or whatever currency whatever amount you want to a gift card in and a good denomination of money uh that will be an incentive for people to want to enter into it. Now, that sum, that money does not change. The prize money will always be the same every quarter. So you can budget it. But how many people enter into it is what changes. So you're not going to have to have any unexpected cost, but more and more people will participate and want to get a chance to win. See how well your security improves when people think that there's something in it for them. It will improve greatly. Because now it's not just about securing the company data. No one cares about the company data. It's about they have a chance to win a prize. Let's make sure I'm not clicking on anything suspicious. Let's make sure I'm watching to make sure people belong where they're supposed to go. And you will see a vast improvement. So I, I want to leave it. It's like uh, on this last part, it's like uh, there is a patch for human stupidity. It's called education. People who say otherwise are stupid. We have gotten to the point in our industry where we've uh, a lot of people have been burned out with the fact that this job sometimes seems impossible. It seems like we're never going to be able to keep everything fixed or everything secure. And you're right. We're not. Especially if we're doing it by just our department, if we're just doing it alone. We are trying to not eliminate risk. Being on the internet is just inherent risk. It's just risky. It's like, so what we have to do is do our best to lower that risk. And one of the best ways to lower that risk is with help. From the CEO to the person in the mailroom, those are members of your information security team. Do you realize that? And more importantly, do they realize that? It's like, because most of your employees don't even realize what information security is or how it actually relates and impacts their job. That's on us. That is on us to fix. 
an employee is doing the same job day in and day out. They are going to be the first one to notice when something strange happens. And if they are going to report that, then you have one of the biggest, most fine-tuned intrusion detection systems known to man. No blinky boxes, no technology. Humans, employees, users, fellow coworkers, that are working with you to secure your network. That is the goal. And just like any IDS system uh, that is built on technology, the human IDS requires fine tuning. It requires to be uh, programmed. It needs that. If it doesn't have it, if it doesn't have the programming, if it doesn't have the signatures, if it doesn't know what to look out for, then yeah, it's not going to catch anything. And that's not the fault of the technology or your users. That was the person putting it in place. And all your employees are in place. They're doing their jobs. Show them how security is part of that job and how to report something that is unusual. So uh, I'm supposed to leave some time for questions. So here we go. Uh, mute. Sorry, sorry, I am mute. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, great talk. Uh, voy a ver si hay preguntas. I am looking for for question. I, I have a lot. <laughs> okay. Voy a hacer una pregunta en español, pero quiero relacionarla con la pandemia. ¿Tú consideras que en pandemia la situación mejoró o empeoró respecto a la conciencia de las personas respecto a la ciberseguridad? Um, just re do you think security is improved? Um, no, no, relacionado a la sensibilización, awareness. Oh, the word. Um, I believe it's starting. Thanks to uh, the news and uh, thanks to television shows. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, that is a double-edged sword. On one hand, they're more aware of threats. On the other hand, they have an exaggerated uh, understanding of what the threat is. They think it's um, like hackers and hoodies on keyboards and not international crime gangs or nation states, people who are trying to profit off of it. Uh, I've always tried to explain to people, hackers are not your problem, criminals are your problem. It's like, that's what people don't understand. It's not about trying to pwn a network or compromise it, it's about making money. If I get robbed by someone with a gun, I don't automatically assume that they made that gun, that they're a gunsmith, that they created it, that they developed it. And it's like that they, you know, pack the bullets themselves, you know, to make sure that they shoot properly. No, they're using a tool to commit a crime. Yeah. Computers are extremely good for committing crime. So criminals are taking tools that hackers may have developed or vulnerabilities they may have discovered that were already in the systems. They just discovered it and did responsible disclosure of it. And then they're using that to make money. 
they don't know how it operates. They don't know how it works. They're just like downloading a YouTube video, seeing how the program runs, and click get paid. I mean, there are some malware and ransomware gangs that operate support lines for their software, for their malware, because the user, because their users, the criminals, don't even understand how to use it. <clears throat> it's like so. We, we, we can't give them that much credit. They're criminals. There are some hackers that are criminals, but most criminals are not hackers. Uh, it's like if I go to a bank and uh, they had the week before a, a bank teller get arrested for money laundering. I don't go to my bank the next week and go and say to my teller, are you a black hat banker or a white hat banker? Because I I don't want to I don't want to work with a white uh, a black hat banker, that sounds stupid. It's like and it's just the same thing with white hat and black hat. It's like you're a hacker, or a criminal. That to me is the designation. Um, so we got to uh, teach our users what the proper threat is. It's no longer like four one nine scams, like the Nigerian prince. They keep looking for that because security keeps teaching them that uh, with misspellings and something fantastical. And then all of a sudden they're getting an email from their CEO about a wire transfer that they need authorized with the employee's name. It's like perfectly spelled and they're falling for it. Yeah. We need to update our training, show them what the real threats are, not what the TV threats are. Eh, excelente. A acá hay una pregunta relacionada, pero que quiero entenderla bien. Primero, el hay una persona que pregunta si es mejor eh, ir actualizando, o sea, mantenerse actualizado o realizar auditorías de seguridad sobre los activos antes que tener un software seguro. Pregunta. O sea, son como varias preguntas. I would say, for one thing, um... Layers are always good. It's always good to have certain layers. Saying that, before you, uh, and I don't mean this like literally, but before you worry about antivirus, before you worry about your infrastructure security, make sure you're updating every single piece of software you can, especially the operating system. Those are free. Operating system updates are free. And most of the vulnerabilities are targeting vulnerabilities that have been patched. Yeah. There are still people in their internal networks whose machines are vulnerable to MS-0867. For those who don't know, that is a Windows vulnerability that came out 2008. 2008, over a decade ago, and they're still vulnerable to that. And that is called the golden key. You can just, the golden ticket. You're just in. It's like go, go get past go, collect the two hundred dollars and all the company data. So that's, we need to keep patching, but also when we're patching our networks, what are we patching? Do you know every device that is on your network? You should have every IP address mapped or computer name that's on your network addressed. And if a new device pops up, Someone should know, because I promise you, nine times out of ten when I'm around, that new device popping up on your network is mine. And it is not named like the rest of your companies. If you see a machine, FYI, called Poning Machine 403, you're going to have a bad day. I mean, that's just what's going to happen. So, yes, you have to, you have to do those two basic things. And that doesn't cost 
contractors or um, extra money. It's like that costs employees and work and effort. And it's well worth it. And that builds your foundation of security. Excelente. Yo tengo una pregunta. Eh, hay dos preguntas más, pero quería hacer una pregunta yo. ¿Cuál es tu opinión sobre las redes sociales y cómo, y cómo han impactado en, en la forma en que las personas se comportan y cómo afectan muchas veces su seguridad también? Ah. Oh. That, that is a good question, especially since uh, I, I've been known to be on social networks from time to time. Um, so uh, I would say one thing, it's um, uh, another double-edged sword. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> so uh, because of the fact that uh, I got my first book deal uh, from Twitter, When I was just starting out as a uh, as a uh, information security guy in a bank, it's like I got that's what started me out on this path to be here speaking to you now was Twitter. But there's a downside to that. I've had people dox me, people who have sent hate things, people who've been disgusting online toward me because I'm more public. Back in the day, we there uh, in IRC and the BBSs, uh, we had uh, a little bit more anom anonymity. There were still jerks, there were still trolls, but I didn't know who you were. Really, it's like you were a face, a picture, a avatar, or a nickname. Uh, you were what you knew. It was your consciousness that I was communicating. With. But now I can see you, and I can see that you're in a different country, or I can see that you look different from me, or I can see that your faith is different from me, or your lifestyle, or your gender is different from me. And that has gone dramatically uh, as a negative, uh, because we have to get to the point where um, – And this, and this is going to be a hard one. It's like, because I can't solve it. But we need to understand that with this internet comes a lot of information and awareness. But it should also come with understanding. And that's the key that we're missing. And the compassion of that understanding It's like one of the things that recently has been going on is, uh, and, and I will straight out admit it, is like where we have um, women in tech, uh, or women in general who post uh, pictures uh, on the internet that they want to pick, post pictures about because they feel confident, they like how they look. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you have men judging them based on that. Whereas if I was a man and I posted the same kind of picture, my responses would be dramatically different. You don't think less of me. You don't think I'm less professional. That's just Jason being Jason. No, that's called a double standard. <laughs> It's like we forget in this industry that women founded it. Women started the computer industry from Ada Lovelace, who created the first computer program before there were computers, to Hedy Lamar, who created uh, shortwave frequencies and worked on Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and submarines, as everybody knows her as an actress. That's what she did. The people who worked in NASA, who put people to the moon, a lot of them women of color, who created those programs, who double-checked the figures. Back in the 70s and 80s, men realized they could make money in this industry. And that's where women disappeared. And so now guys are like, where did all the women go? Motherfucker, we took them. We took them out. You're not trying to get women into technology. You're trying to let them come back in. 
and we're not doing and and the thing is that we keep saying even in our phraseology is there's no letting they belong here we need to accept it hmm. it's like and you need to stop judging people based on their uh, physical characteristics how i look does not judge me or my abilities reproductive organs or lack thereof it's like do not make what i am how i identify as a gender how i identify with my faith or my culture or my country does not change in any iota what i know this is who you are yeah everything else is extra and social media is getting people focalized on all this instead of this show me what you can do show me your actions show me by what you share show me who you are by what you know care less about what you look like Excelente. Gran respuesta, Jason. Muchas gracias. Es, es, es realmente una keynote y un honor tenerte con nosotros. Y quiero hacer la última pregunta, que, que es muy buena. Dice, el usuario final es el eslabón más débil de la cadena. ¿Cómo lo convences en una frase de lo importante que es la ciberseguridad? Um, quite frankly, um, yes, we we do have the, uh, we do consider the users the weakest link because right now they are because we've made them that way. I will run this by you. Your company, your fictional company hires delivery drivers. On day one of their job, when they first start, Do you hand them the keys and their route and tell them to go drive the company van and start deliveries? No. You teach them. You tell them what your rules are, what their policies are supposed to be. You tell them that they have to wear a seatbelt every single time. They have to do blinkers. You'll put a sign on the back of the truck with the phone number if they're doing bad behavior or they're driving badly. You put devices in their vehicles to monitor them to make sure they're not speeding. You let them know that they have to follow traffic laws. That's part of their job responsibility as a delivery driver. And if they wreck that van, they will face penalties. If a delivery driver of yours wrecks your van three times, will they be still your employee? after the third time we have no problem firing that person from that wrecked van day one someone comes to work with their job and you hand them a computer and you tell them there you go have fun you don't tell them about the threats what rules they're supposed to follow for safe computer driving so to speak the operation of that uh, uh, equipment that you just gave them or the responsibilities for it. And if they jeopardize the security of that equipment or the network more than a certain amount of times, then they could lose their job. Oh, hold on, hold on. You mean if I click a bad email, it's like, more than once i'm gonna get fired i say soon but i say first the first time you click the, uh, a phishing email or an actual testing email you get a warning and re-education you're forced to go back to another one hour class on security awareness specialized for people who have made those mistakes on how to better uh look at emails how to better go through them show them the different simulations and, and show them the workings of why that's a problem. The second time they do it, 
you limit their access to email. You actually give them some kind of quarantine that they have to go and then review. Their email goes to a different section and they have to send that email. Make it a little bit more difficult, but safer for a month or two months while they're going through this process. If they click at three, they're probably an insider threat. Get them out of your company. It's like they shouldn't be there. It's like a delivery driver that wrecks a van can cost you thousands thousands of dollars in damage to those vehicles. Target lost over $300 million because some other employee in another company clicked a phishing email link. Hmm. And we care more about delivery drivers and vans than your uh, guy in accounting uh, clicking on random emails. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, you rock, really. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I hope to see you the, the next year in Chile, and we see you in DEFCON. Definitely. I would love that. Right. And, and hugs wherever we meet, no matter what. I'm vaccinated, so it'll be fine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Y muchas gracias a todos. Nosotros volvemos en minutos con Carmen Torrano, así que no se muevan de su asiento. Adiós. Adiós, muchas gracias. <laughs>